All right, uh, welcome to week six. Um, so hopefully you guys watched the pre-recorded lecture as in that exact lecture from last semester. Uh, so it's the exact same material I covered. So the way I was gonna do this is I'll open the floor for uh, some questions. Uh, if anybody has you know very specific questions like that want to be answered. Uh, then I'll talk about the midterm, which is next week. And then I will actually do a top to bottom example of the whole normalization process. Um, I think the recording had one. Uh, this one I might, it's a very similar example, um, but I'll go through it start to end completely on the board, um, which is why my camera's now living there instead of here, so I can get both boards recorded. Um, all right, so wasn't the best lecture to have to skip. Um, <laughs> it's actually a, a rough one. Um, however, does anybody have any outstanding questions in their minds about what was in that lecture? And if you don't, yes. Yeah. Right. Um, so depending what he decided to call four. So one to three covers 98% of most database designs. There's normalization, like there's fourth normal form, which we don't teach at all in this course. Um, fourth normal form is for uh, what we call edge cases, where, you know, there's a specific set of circumstances to the data and it's designed to handle that very specific case. Um, the thing is that for 95% of databases, once you reach third normal form, it's in Boyce Cod, fourth, fifth, and sometimes sixth. Like it literally, once you reach a certain stage, sometimes it just encompasses all the others past it. Um, fourth normal form is there to, uh, handle repeating values in a given column. Um, which, depending on how you decided to do the first normal form, you've already eliminated that problem. It just depends on which technique you use to start. Will eliminate the fourth normal form. Um, but yeah, realistically, third normal form covers vast majority, and for most in most industries, third normal form is considered adequate, or actually more than adequate. It's it's good enough. Um, like I said, Boyce Cod covers cases where you don't necessarily have, um, you have a cross reference between two things where the identifiers could be, you know, I, either or. Um, so in that case, you end up creating uh, surrogate keys. Usually creating a surrogate key fixes like 90% normalization key issues. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, I will. I will actually go through the whole thing top to bottom after I talk about the midterm. Because I, I just, I don't want to, I want to get the midterm stuff out of the way. So you guys are aware and any other little announcements. And then I can just concentrate on doing a proper job front to back. Because when I do the example, I'm going to normalize, diagram it all the way down to physical diagram. Literally, I'm going to start from unnormalized data all the way to physical diagrams. So I'll be walking back and forth on both boards. Uh, for a good half hour while I do it. Any other questions? Going once, going twice, going three times. And if you did not watch the pre-recorded lecture, you probably should. Uh, considering, you know, you literally had two hours last week booked for this class and, you know, it was a good time to actually watch it. Um, one of the few times I actually had to cancel my lecture, that was years ago, but I was still recording my lectures back then. Most of the students actually came to class. One of the students hooked up their laptop to the projector and they just sat here and watched my recording on the screen as a group. It was kind of cute. <laughs> One of the students sent me a picture to show me. I was uh, quite ill that time. All right, midterm. Okay, so it is 45 questions. So it's not like a super long midterm. It is, 
multiple choice and true and false. Every question has only one correct answer. There's not, you know, pick two or there's one correct answer for every one. It is Scantron. Now, have you guys done a Scantron test yet? Uh, okay. Um, I'm going to put a note right here for everybody then. Because I'm going to post this right on Brightspace. No, that's not what I wanted you to do. Okay. So, actually, hang on, where did I put them? This is what a Scantron sheet looks like. I just went and went shopping upstairs to grab some, so I have them for next week. Um, they're blue. If yours isn't blue, you got the wrong kind of paper. You don't need to bring your own. I'm giving it to you. I'm just saying. Um, on here, there's two very important uh, items. Actually, you know what? I wonder if I come here, will my camera do it so I can point this out? Nope, because what am I doing? I'm recording. Duh. That was stupid of me. That was really dumb. Holy crap, was that ever dumb. Um, th that was so funny. That was funny. That was actually... No, no, no. I'm still... Uh, I was in meetings for like seven hours today, so my brain's kind of meeting fried. Um, there, that works. Good enough. Actually, let me go turn off the light and you'll be able to see a little better. I just want to try to figure out a way to zoom it in. Uh, this one? Excellent. Okay, let's try this again so you guys can see. So this is what the Scantron sheets look like. Of course, it's mirrored because, you know, computer camera. This here is where you put your name. You got to write, you got to fill in the names up here, but you got to fill in the bubbles. If you don't fill in, the, fill in the bubbles, the Scantron machine doesn't know who you are. Student number, same deal. So when you fill it in in the instructions of the exam, I'm pretty sure tell you, fill in your name, fill in your student number. Um, the rest of this is not important. Well, this side's very important, but the rest of this side is not important. If you don't want to do anything here, that's fine. But this is the very important side. Now, another thing that a lot of people don't realize with Scantron is how finicky it is. So you'll notice that there's five bubbles, right? And it you have to use a pencil. A pen will not work. Yes, I've heard that the ones at Carlton will take pen. Congratulations, they got a fancy machine. The one here uses the reflection off the light of the pencil to scan. So there's a light that flashes. And it actually sees the reflection off the, LED, the 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 pencils. Pens, the ink soaks into the paper so it doesn't reflect. Just so you know. So the interesting thing about Scantron, so when you fill it in, you want to fill in the whole bubble. Like that. Well, you know, as much as you can. Try not to go outside the lines too much. I know we all suck at coloring inside the lines, but this is good. This, 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 and... Uh, you know, that will probably not get scanned. Fill in the whole bubble. Which leads me to item number two. Scantron scans the results left, right. And you're thinking, well, why is that important for me to know? Which is where the bring a really good eraser part comes in. Let's say you first filled it in and you went like this and then you go oh crap that's not quite right so you do a really crappy job erasing it and then you fill in the one you wanted to fill in if this isn't erased properly it'll come here see it and stop now, these are truths about scantron which you know if some of you have done it you may have experienced this before um, so do a really good job erasing it. Or if you can't get it erased, just put up your hand and I'll give you another Scantron sheet. There's, I've got lots. So 
So that's the importance about filling in the Scantron sheet, the things you need to know. This is how you fill it in properly. And you want to make sure it's erased properly. I mean, if it's mostly gone, like like that, that's fine. It's when you, there's like still some black left inside the circle, enough that the machine could get confused. And our Scantron machine is from the Cretaceous period. Um, they had problems getting it working with Windows 10. Gives you an idea how old it is. Like the original Scantron machine the profs got to use um, ran Windows XP. Right, so it's probably as old as some of you in this room. Um, well, not necessarily, but pretty darn close. Like we're talking, sub, it probably dates like mid 90s, early 2000. So yeah, technically it probably is as old as some of you in this room. So it's old technology. It works fine. It works great. I basically drop off my master address sheet and my pieces of paper and magically I get an email the next day and they say, here are the people that failed. Um, all right, so that's the important thing about Scantron. HB pencil, not the hard lead pencils. You know how there's different hardnesses for pencils? HB is the preferred. It's the one you'll have the least problems with. It also tends to be the easiest one to erase. Because you don't have to press hard to make it go black. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, as long as it's an HB lead. Uh, yeah, a mechanical pencil, fine. I, actually, that's what I use at home when I'm filling in the, uh, the the master score sheet. So that's cool. No problem there. Mechanical pencil is cool as long as it's an HB lead. Um, HB2 may or may not work. Uh, just stick to HB. Um, I mean, you can get a pack of 10 for $1.50 at Dollarama. So... It's not exactly an expensive investment. Um, it is 75 minutes, which is very generous, just so you know. The Canadian University Standard for a Multiple Choice Exam Bruh, I called you guys out two weeks ago. If you're going to be 15 minutes late, don't bother to show up. The university standard in Canada for a multiple choice exam is 30 seconds a question. The logic behind that is, if you know the material well, you should be able to answer the question in 30 seconds, under 30 seconds, and you can build up time for questions you have problems with. The college standard, the Ontario, the Ontario college standard, is uh, 55 seconds a question. Why do colleges have a lower standard? You've got me, but our standard is lower. Um, what we tend to do, at least those of us that teach this course, well, we tend to give even more time than that. Which right now, if you look at 75 minutes for 45 questions, that's almost two minutes a question. Uh, why do we do that? Show of hands for people where English is their first language. See, my hand didn't even go up. No, I'm French. It doesn't show, but I am. So English is not my first language, although might as well be now. So in here we had, what, two, maybe three hands that went up? And I could actually say out of those that are English, how many of you are Canadian English first? And then I'd probably lose one hand. Usually that's how it usually goes. So... We tend to be very forgiving with the time, at least for the midterm. The final exam, you know, the time comes down a little bit because by now you're starting to get used to how the questions are set up. But for your first midterm, we tend to give you guys almost two minutes a question. That should be more than enough to get the midterm done. Um, so what does it cover? It covers slide decks one to five and review the hybrid material. Uh, I've read through the exam. I really didn't see much that was specific to the hybrid, but there might, there was a few, like I didn't write the whole exam, right? It was a, a like four profs pooled their questions together and we regurgitated an exam. And I, I scanned through it. It looked okay. But I always put in the caveat of include the hybrid material. Uh, everything you should know should come from the slide decks and understanding of the lecture material. So, that's my coverage of the midterm. I don't actually don't do an actual review. An actual, you know, let's try to cover five weeks of material in 
45 minutes because I record my lectures. <laughs> if you're not sure, you can just go back. You know, if you're reviewing and you're not sure and you go back. Um, and the, the thing is, is over the 45 questions, the material is pretty much broken down evenly between each week. So, you know, if you take 45 divided by five, there's roughly what, nine questions per, per week. Roughly, that's not exact, but it's roughly what it, the breakdown is. So there isn't one specific topic that's being uh, highlighted harder than anything else. Um, now, to alleviate some of the concerns about some of the questions you may have, especially the normalization ones, because, you know, recorded lecture. Um, most of the normalization questions are more about, do you understand what the definitions of normalization are? More that there's no example saying, here's an example, I want you to solve it. There's none of that. This is, you know, do you understand the definitions of what first, second, and third normal form? Which, you know, is what last week's lecture was about. Okay. Any questions about the midterm? Before I proceed with my example. Well, in theory, you should review the slides and the hybrids and make sure you understand. Then if you go through it and you're not sure about some of the topics, then you can jump to a recorded lecture for that week. Because the good news is each recording matches the slide deck. So you go, oh, I'm not sure about that. So let's go see what Dan had to say around this. So it's an ideal way of doing it. Yes. Fairly evenly, like not exactly, but it's roughly like there's 45 questions. There's five weeks. 45 divided by five is nine. It's roughly, you know, so somewhere between seven and 10 questions per section. So one may have a few more or less, but the other ones, it's all pretty evenly distributed. Yeah. Uh, definitions. Yeah, this is more about, uh, the midterm is more about th the theory of things. So, you know, what's the def different definitions for normal form? Um, what is, um, like, there's a few questions about uh, what is the an appropriate data type for things. So you should know what your different data types are. You know, car versus varkar versus int, for example. Yeah. Only if you make it a quick trick question. I, what I do with my midterms, because it's the same midterm as everyone else, but I review it and adjust some of the questions so it's closer to my own wording. What I do, hey, 22 minutes, bro. Okay. Um, what was I saying? Because that just threw me right off. Oh, yes. So what I do is I, I print the exam at home, then I hand it to my daughter. 23 years old. She's studying in CST, not in this program. So don't, don't even bother to try to find her. She's doing her co-op right now. But the point is, is that I write the questions such a, their questions are written in such a way that she's able to read them and understand what the question is asking without knowing the material. She might not know the right answer, but she's going through checking for grammar, for consistency, punctuation, stuff that turns things into trick questions. There will not be any double negatives or triple negatives, which I have seen on some of these questions in the past. Um, these, the questions are clear, straightforward. I don't see the point of trying to trick you. Um, we used to have a prof that has a saying that the student didn't read all the words. That's just stupid. Maybe you didn't understand one of the words, but you should be able to understand the rest of the question, regardless of what word was used uh, by inference. All right. Any more questions? Going once, going twice going three times. Okay. So the next quick topic I want to cover is the assignment, assignment one. 
Sunday night. It's due. The rule is it must be submitted before you demo. You cannot, you only need to get one group member to submit, please. If, at least for those in my lab section, just one group member submit. Don't, don't have three, all three or four, all two or three of you submit it because it just looks like I've got more grading than I really need to do. And it gets confusing because I'll download them all and they're arranged by people's names. So I'll do one and I grade, oh, that's good. I get people's grades. And then, you know, 10 minutes later, I read another one. I'm like, this looks familiar. Are they cheating? Right? And then I go, oh, wait, same group. No, they didn't listen. I should take points off. Uh, I'm kidding. But as a rule of thumb, one group member submits. Please. It must be submitted no later than Sunday night. If it is not submitted, you are not allowed to demo. You are not allowed to demo. Goose egg. Zero. In case you don't understand. Or how many fingers am I holding up? Not all group members should be present for the demo unless somebody is drastically out of commission. Considering you are scheduled for a lab at that period, you have no excuse to not be there unless you are sick, contagious, passing a kidney stone, right? I had a student show up trying to, while they were trying to pass a kidney stone. I'm like, no. You're, if you were in my lab section, you demo to me. If you are with a lamb or wander, then you demo to them. The demo is us making sure you did the work. It's not for me. Normally, it usually takes my, at least for me, it takes three to five minutes. I sit down, I ask a few questions about the work you did discuss with you some of the things I've noticed. And then, you know, I'll ask, why did you choose to do this? And if nobody can answer, that means you probably didn't do the work yourself. Somebody, that's why the whole group should be there. So at least one person can answer the question and save your bacon. Essentially. Uh, well, you should have, A, contacted me well before today. Um you're probably working on your own and finishing it on your own. That's okay. Um, if you have any classmates that, if there's anybody in my lab section that has not found a partner yet, because I know I had one person email me saying they didn't have a partner yet. And I said, well, you might be out of luck. Um, I'm not going to pull up their email because that's just wrong. Um, but I will... Um, Send me an email. I'll see if I can get you guys connected. But it's going to be really rough. Like, you know, you guys knew about this almost a month ago. So you've had a month to get groups and get started on this work. It is what it is. Um, but yeah, Sunday night, midnight must be submitted unless you have a really good reason. Uh, there's always somebody has a good reason. Or they think they do. Um, and then you will do the demo. And then once the lab period is done, I'll just hit the publish button and you'll know your grades. Um, odds are I'll have most of those assignments pre-graded before you even come into the class because I've already looked at everything. It's just me verifying you didn't. Uh, uh, it used to be, um, what is it? Chegel? Cheg? Whatever the heck it is. That you, that's how people used to get other people to do their work for them. Now they just ask some AI to do the work for them. And uh, I just want to make sure that, you know, you did it yourself. All right. So that's the info about the midterm, the assignment. Now I'm going to do the example that covers pretty much everything we learned this semester, start to end, in one go. All right. I just want to make sure my batteries aren't dead here. Okay. So now let me make this a little bigger. Is that good? Yeah, that works. All right, so you'll see that I've got some sample data up on the screen. Actually, I wonder if I can scroll this up just a little. Okay, keep going, keep going, keep going. Stop. Yay. Okay. 
So we have an example up on the screen. And this is already technically in first normal form. And what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to write down uh, down the side here what the different definitions are so you guys are aware. I really wish I had more whiteboard, but I don't. Um, okay. Yeah, over here. All right, to be in first normal form, we have to have no Okay, part of definition number one for first normal form is there's no repeating groups of columns. For those of you that wonder what that means, um, that would be as if I were to clear this. So when you look at it, then this is very similar to the lab you just did. Um, this over here is a repeating group of columns. It, it basically means that all these values belong to this one entity. So there's a repeating group of columns. Uh, sometimes this is also known as a, a multi-valued attribute. So if, they, if there's only one column, it's a multi-valued attribute. If there's a group of columns, it's a repeating group of columns. So no repeating groups of columns, no multi valued attributes. And th this last one depends on who you ask. Um, some textbooks will include it, some don't. The primary key was identified. So we have identified how we can uniquely pull up a single column of data. And when we look at this data, we can we know that we can if we grab the employee number, the invoice number, and the project number, we can uniquely identify any given row. So we actually have a three-way compound primary key for starters. And um, so that's why I was saying this example currently is in first normal form. So what I'm going to do is I am going to rewrite this, but just in the normalization format that I had you guys doing in the assignment. So we, we can call this, uh, actually let's call it uh, um, billing. I'm just pulling out a name. And this is going to go employee number, name, email, rate, ID, hourly. Rate, invoice, number. Oh, am I going to have enough room here? Project, number, project. Okay, I'm going to write that one a little short and out. Okay. And we, we've already identified that our primary keys, I'm sorry for the guys, the people at the back that the writing's so small, I just have so much board space. We know that the employee number, the invoice number, and the project number is our um, primary key. So now I'm gonna turn this on. Try that again. Okay, because I don't need the data anymore. So I am going to turn off the projector for now. Okay. Wow, that's I did write that small.
now it's on. Anyways, it's a good thing everybody's here and paying attention. Um, yeah, so they decided they were going to add in attributes to help people understand. So, there's not going to be asked if you need to have the attributes or not. It's nothing like that. You don't have to worry about it. Okay, so now, the only thing in here, so I identified the, pri the uh, primary keys. The only thing that you don't see on here is foreign keys, because normally in a conceptual diagram, you don't include the foreign keys. Foreign keys are not part of the ride. So you um, you don't include. The only time where it makes sense to include them is if they participate in the primary key like this. So in here, I would actually add the employee number and the uh, project number where did my green marker go okay so conceptual diagram i am now taking up i'm erasing this board and i'm moving to this board to finish so i'm going to go from conceptual to logical and then logical to physical. I'm going to do the logical and the physical on the same board because they're almost the same. Okay. And I need this. Okay. So I am going to start with the employee table and I'm going to make it nice and wide so I have room to work. As this is where you're going to notice I'm going to start following naming conventions. Up till now, naming conventions had no meaning, but now they start having meaning. Employees. And the thing is, I'm still going to stick to the field names that I have. They're just going to be Snake case. So we have an employee, we know we have employee number, name, and email. Great. We know that our employee number is our primary key. Logical diagram of employees. And we have our rate ID and the hourly rate. And we know our rate ID is our primary key. Fantastic. Now, You will notice that I have not put in the foreign keys yet because I'll put those in soon. And our last one over here is billing. Can somebody take a guess why I'm not putting the foreign keys in yet? Just out of curiosity, somebody can think, figure out my thought process. You're, you're 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 almost there. The law. The reason why I didn't put in the foreign keys yet is because I haven't put in the relationships yet. So if you don't draw in the relationships, you don't put in the foreign keys yet. So now I'm going to start with this one. So rates to projects, as you'll notice, it's optional on both ends. So it's, and the rate ID does not participate 
in the primary key. So it's a non-identifying relationship. And we know it's a like that. So now we're going to add in the rate ID down here. ID, and we know that this is a foreign key. Um, in the original data, we know that the employee participated in the primary key, so this is actually going to be an ID. It's in my hand. This is going to be an identifying relationship. So that's why the line is solid instead of dashed. So you know when you played in My MySQL Workbench, you've already noticed if you did non-identifying, the line was dashed. If it was identifying, the line was solid. If you haven't, you should try it and see. You'll see there's a difference in the lines. Identifying means that the foreign key participates in the primary key. So now I'm going to add employee number. And employee number is part of the primary key, but it's also it's a foreign key, which this also means this is a weak entity because it can't exist without the rest. And our last relationship is the project. Like such, and we have project number, which again is part of the primary key, and it's also a foreign key. Logical diagram. Can you ask us to do that? Because it's because I just realized the difference between physical and conceptual. I thought that they are the same, but the drawing tool is different. So I did that. Yeah, yeah, well, the, the lab the, when you're talking about the normalization lab, I actually asked for a conceptual diagram. But I mean, if you gave me a physical or logical, I'd still accept it as long as you demonstrated that you understood what you were doing. That's what I'm after. Okay, so this is a logical diagram, not a physical diagram. Can somebody tell me why? What the difference is? No, the foreign keys are there. Data types. There's no data types. So a logical diagram, the only difference, the only real difference between a logical and a physical diagram is the logical diagram can apply to any database server. The physical, di the physical diagram is specific to the server you're going to install, you put it on. So a physical diagram for MySQL would be different than a physical diagram for Postgres, probably. And probably different, again, for the other ones. Okay, so now we're going to put in our data types. So we're going to start with um, in the original data, the employee number was just a number. So we're probably safe to assume it's an int. Okay. So usually when you fill it out in here, you also fill it out down there. And if you're using a tool like MySQL Workbench, it just creates the keys for you and it sets the data types automatically. Rate ID. Again, that was an integer. So that'll also be an int. The invoice number was also just a straight up number. You may or may not remember that the project number on the other hand, was written like that. It's a string. And all the numbers were two digits dash three digits. So six characters. Just to be safe, we should probably give ourselves an extra, right? And really, you could just use a var car, but I'm guessing you're going to use a car just so that there's a bit of variety on the diagram. There's no benefit in either direction. So that'll be a car seven. Rate. All right, hourly rate. Now, in the original data, it just showed a number with no decimal places. But realistically, hourly rates could have decimal places, you know, $95, 50 cents an hour kind of thing. So we're probably going to want to use a numeric or a decimal. They're the same thing. 
and we will want to make it a five comma two. Five comma two means we are going to store nine digits with two reserved for the decimal places. So five, two. So that's why that one's there. So we can probably safely assume for hours, some companies bill solid full hours, some companies bill half hours, some bill, people bill by the quarter hour, lawyers bill by the minute. So we can probably, again, use a numeric. But this one here, you'd probably want, um, five two is probably enough because you're probably not going to charge more than 999 hours on one invoice because that's, that you can't do that in a month, right? So, so you could probably do a five two. If you want to be really safe, you do a six two. Just so, just in case you have a weird month where you know lots of people worked on it. Oh yeah, our project number was also a car seven, so we got to remember to add that down here. And the last ones, okay, project description. This is where a business decision needs to come in. Is this like an entire paragraph describing the, the project or is it just like the name of the project? On the original data, you notice it was like simple things like UX design or, you know, so we can probably go with just a straight up Varkar 50. 50 was more than enough to handle any of the descriptions that were there. It's all good. So now we are left with this. Name. In our data, the name was one single field. Some business needs, you'll want to split the name into two fields or three fields. In some parts of the world, some people only have one name. No, some parts of India, people have one name. Some parts of uh, Polynesia, people have one name. They don't have family names. They just have a name. Uh, I really don't know how that works, but, you know, they have one name. So, we want to make sure that we have lots of room for a really long name. Um, I once had a student from Puerto Rico, Hispanic name, not just a normal Hispanic name, it was a good Catholic Hispanic name. He had five first names, three middle names, plus his last name. And the best part of him, he'd actually answer to any of them. It became a game with me and him the whole semester if I could make him not realize I was talking to him. And he, every time. So, Varkar 100 for names. It's safe. Just give yourself lots of room. And now we have email. Uh, did I ever tell you guys the story about the really long email address? I don't think so. So... When I first moved to Ottawa in 1997, which is probably before some of you were born. So 1997, I was working for a company called Digital Equipment Corporation. Most of you have probably never heard of Digital Equipment. They were one of the major high-tech employers in the Ottawa area. They had offices in Canada, uh, Bell's Corners, um, back when it was called Hull, before it was changed to Gatineau. They had close to seven or 8,000 employees in the Ottawa area. Compaq bought them. Some of you may recognize the name Compaq. Compaq was then bought by HP. There's a name everybody in this room probably recognizes. So when I was working there, I was writing software for one of their call centers. I was writing call tracking software. And I inherited a code base because, you know, they already had stuff, so they just gave it to me. And the guy who wrote it before me decided 46 characters was enough for an email address. I'm like, you know, that's not too bad. You know, if I look at mine, you know, I look at my name and whatever it is at gmail.com, even with my long name, I, 45 would handle that just fine. Until one day, it Dan's there plunking away in his uh, cubicle, right? And good little corporate slave. Poop, 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 poop. And my phone rings. My phone never rings. I'm like, oh, this is fun. Pick up the phone. Uh, Dan, I can't put in an email address in. I'm going, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you? Sure. Click, get up, walk like 700 meters to the other end of the building. Look at him. He goes, this is the person's email address. She was from Quebec. 
most of you in here probably doesn't know what that means. She had a hyphenated first name. Cool. But it's not like her name was like J-O dash Anne. Her name was like, like Joanne dash Antoinette or something. So she had this really long first name. First problem. Period. If anybody knows about how married names happen in Quebec, when women get married, they get a hyphenated last name. Boudreau, not Goudreau, Boudreau, dash, I don't remember what the other one was, but it was long. So, you know, you look at my last name, right? G-A-U-D-R-E-A-U-L-T. 10 letters in my last name, 10, 11 letters in my last name. She had a combination of 24 letters for her last name, plus a hyphen. Okay? We, we can now see that we're now quickly running out of room in the 46. But it gets worse. At, okay, cool, we all know about at. That's not a mystery. Back then, email addresses aren't like they are now. Like, you know if you email somebody to the government of Ontario, it's just a person's name at ontario.on.gov or whatever it is, right? Or actually, I think now it's just ontario.ca even. Back then, because each department ran their own mail server, they had to route the mail by the department. So this lady worked for the MNR, the Ministry of Natural Resources. So she had the big long name at, get a load of this, Ministry of Natural Resources. Ministère des Ressources Naturelles. When dot gov. It was like, like it took the guy like a minute and a half to type in the email address. That is the day I decided that all email addresses are Varkar 150. <laughs> and I really wish I was making up the story. But I didn't because I had to emergency patch the software. So the guy wrote the lady's email address in the notes of the call so they at least know how to contact her to, by email. And then I emergently patched the database at 3 a.m. Instead of being at home in my bed, I went home, had supper, went back to my office because, you know, 1990s, we didn't exactly have uh, easy ways to work remotely like we do now. And I patched that software at, um, yeah, 3 a.m., pushing the patch out to 100, 100 technicians. It was a good time. Email address, 150 minimum. Make it 200 if you want to be safe. But never 46. I don't know where 46 came from. I have no idea. It was such a weird number that the guy picked. Man, if I could see Andre today, I'd kick him in the knees. It still makes me angry. 20, 25 years later. <laughs> so, logical to physical. There it is. So that was the entire process that you guys learned from week one to week four. Realistically, another thing you do at this point is you identify things that are null or not null, which is something I forgot to do with my other group. And here we decide what's important, right? The hourly rate probably should be not null because what's the point of putting it in if you don't have an hourly rate? So this would probably be not null. The project description could be null. So we'll leave it like that. The Rate ID, since it's optional, is definitely null. So this one is nullable. This one's nullable. The primary key is always not null. Right? So not null. Not null. The first, the person's name is probably not null, but maybe they don't have an email address yet because they haven't been assigned an email address. So email address could be nullable. And um, over here, everything is going to be not null. Because why would you have a billing entry if you don't have any hours? So this is all. Not null. Just like that. And that's, you know, you've heard Dan's logic behind making his choices, which is a useful thing to hear sometimes. And now I'm going to take a picture of this. And that's it. <laughs> we are uh, pretty much done. There we go. So you are in this room for your uh, as usual, there'll be no devices on the desk. Your phones go away. 
smartwatches. I see that big fat piece of tech on your wrist. I'll be confiscating the piece of tech. I don't have one, so maybe I need one. I'm, I'm kidding. I wouldn't take it, but put it away. Um, if I don't think anybody in here writes in Cal, so don't worry about it. If you do write in Cal, your test will be dropped off in time. I just don't remember. All right, that's it, guys.